forgotten. So, hi everyone, I'm Kirsten. I am going to tell you a little bit about myself, but I don't have a slide on it because I think those are lame. Um, I founded Drupal for Gov back in 2009 and have been running Drupal GovCon since 2013. So this year will be our 11th Drupal GovCon. I think it's 11th. Um, I am a technical manager for a government agency. So a lot of the experiences I have with after action reviews are because of working in government. We have instituted them across multiple types of agencies that I've worked for. I used them much more heavily at the Department of Veterans Affairs than my current job. So I have more experience with sort of the DOD way of doing things. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do an introduction of what this topic is. Then we're going to dive into the planning, its implementation, and then give you some additional resources, um, which I used to compile this because after action reviews have been going on for decades. This is not new. It just, ha there's so much information out there, you can kind of get lost in it. So what I'm going to present is how we do it on my projects, not necessarily how everyone does it, and I think there's enough literature out there so that you can modify it for your own needs. So, introductions. First, I think there's some common definitions we have to get out of the way. Um, Postmortems. I'm not going to read the slide to you because you can all read. An after action review is not a postmortem. There is a blameless portion to it, but it's not the same. A root cause analysis is sort of the starting point of what you do in an AAR, and then you take it like, to the next level. I think of it as sort of a combination of root cause analysis and post-mortem with a lot more collaboration involved. Um, obviously, the Army's definition is that it's a structured process for examining an incident. So, Analogies are really great for kind of describing what an AAR is. And we're going to start with, so you want to bake a pie. Now, if you have, let's say, a bunch of Granny Smith apples, that's fantastic. They tend to be lower on the um, water content, so they make a great apple pie. But if you have Red Delicious apples, Please don't bake an apple pie with those. It will be terrible. When you're doing an AAR, it's kind of like baking an apple pie. You need all of the right combinations of things to get out of it what you need so that you can learn from the experience. Because if the incident that happens is you had red delicious apples and you still thought you could make an apple pie, the lesson you've learned in that is that red delicious apples don't make pies. That's a really great lesson to learn. An expensive lesson that took several hours to learn and not a delicious one, but it's at least a lesson you can learn from that you can document and make sure it doesn't happen again. And also you can pass on to everyone else so they don't do it. So this is basically how we're gonna go about talking about after action reviews. And what I'm curious about in the room is how many folks have actually done an AAR? Okay, one, excellent. So I also think it's really important that you have like a background to where it really kind of rose from. And this is an army definition because you can only have them really long and really long and really, really long. Um, but this is basically how this evolved. And there's lots of literature on how the Army uses after action reviews in the field with soldiers on the ground. So they don't just use it in training exercises, they use it after something happens too. Um, taking that information and then incorporating it into training exercises for the future really helps you understand where you can make improvements or make changes 
and save yourself time, money, and um, human beings. So, an after action review. We start by doing planning. Most of the information in here I have pulled from the USAID after action review guidance and the US Forest Service guidance on how to do an AAR and OSHA. OSHA re re doesn't require. OSHA recommends to employers that when an incident happens that injures a worker, that they actually review the entire incident. So if you're on a factory line and a worker loses, let's say, a finger, what led up to that incident? Who was involved? What were all the steps that took place before that happened? And then what can you learn to make sure no other worker will lose a finger in the future? What could you have done to save the worker's finger? All of the questions you kind of have to ask yourself in order to be able to verify that the work that you did was in a way that um, can be used as a training and learning tool. So what you're going to do is to do your after action review after an incident, you put together a list of the people who will need to be in a meeting and you do all your pre-planning. I want to know who's going to be in my meeting. I'm going to need to tell them who's allowed to speak and who's not. I'm going to need to make sure, is this going to be an in-person one? Are we doing it on a Zoom? How are we actually organizing? How do we do the root cause analysis and put it into paperwork and make sure that all of the people who were involved in that are actually part of the meeting that we will have when we do the analysis? Then I prepare for the AR. So this is just... I kind of organize my thoughts and then I put it all together. And in the putting it together part, I also create an agenda for our attendees. And one of the really, really big things for when I do an AAR is that everyone gets invited. But if you didn't have a specific role in it, you don't get to speak, which is really important for leadership. They feel like they need to be involved, but they don't always want to, uh, you know, they really want to speak up, and it's really important that they not. Because in order for us to be able to maintain that blameless aspect, it's really important for them to not speak. So I usually give them really specific direction on what they can and can't do in an AAR. And usually they listen to me. I think it's my authoritative. So, to conduct an AAR, what's really crucial is that people actually participate. Yeah, I highlighted it for a reason. If you start your AAR and the people that you have in the meeting don't want to talk about what happened, for instance, several years ago at an agency, we had this horrible issue with latency. We couldn't figure out what was going on. Every so often, and it wasn't like we knew when it was going to happen, it would just cause our site to look like it was down and we would all get pinged. Everything was cached. It wasn't a problem. People could still get to the site. We thought it was down. So what was this latency issue that was being caused? We were participating in bug bounty. And we were getting hit basically with a DNS attack during the bug bounty. If they could have warned us, we could have made sure that we had more um, coverage so that that wouldn't have happened. We could have worked with our CDN to make sure that bug bounties um, IP addresses weren't blocked and we didn't constantly have it hitting the database. They were hitting one specific form. We could have done so much better. But what it did make it clear for us in the AAR is all of those things that we didn't do, the communication that we didn't get, the um, lack of our ability to even understand why it was happening. We didn't know any of this. And because it had happened so many times, 
At the time that we did the AR, it was like our third time, and I really wish we had done it earlier. We probably would have figured out it was bug bounty. But instead of that, we didn't participate. When we did start participating and everybody started having ideas of what it was that was causing the issue, and we looked at the logs, and then we started looking for security people who might participate in the meeting. When we started involving all of these other folks to participate, we started learning what was actually causing our issues. Um, that kind of brings us down to this whole ensure honest, candid, and professional dialogue. Oftentimes when someone is worried about how they're going to be perceived, sometimes they will use words that are inappropriate or they'll um, start creating, I, I think of it as the blame game. And it becomes more of a difficult conversation instead of the communication that we need in order to find all of the avenues for things that we can repair. So it's really important that whoever is doing the felicit I'm going to say felicitation, that's not right. Facilitation. <laughs> whoever is doing the facilitation needs to be able to have the authority and the respect of the attendees and the participants to bring them back. This is the issue we're talking about. You can't talk about it in this way. And just be able to create like more of a consensus around the topics that you're doing. Um, another thing that's really, really important is you need to scribe, because you need to record all of these key points. I like to record these sessions only so that you use like Fathom or something like that, so that I can get an actual um, list of the words that were said. I don't need the video. I don't need to see anybody's face. But actually having a clear list of everything that happened is really, really helpful in making sure that you learn from the experience. So what happens after you do all of this? You did the planning, you did your implementation, you have conducted the meeting. Now what? So what I like to do is in the meeting, we, I try to come up with three action items and at a minimum. I want everyone who is attending the meeting to come up with something that they specifically can contribute back to what we've learned. So whatever your lesson learned is, how do you become accountable for that particular lesson? So through consensus building, we agree to several uh, items. The one example I had earlier about the latency issue, my takeaway from that was that we would change the form to create not just the honeypot, which we were using, but also to add a CAPTCHA, which I'm not a fan of, but it would help to force the bug bounty folks to either alert us so they can actually test or would allow us to um, force them to do more human-related um, connections. Additionally, we made changes to the CDN. Um, again, things that we were able to put into our AAR for the lessons that we learned, and then the actions that we could take. Not all of your actions will be able to be taken. Sometimes you have to go through multiple levels, at least a government agency. But it's really helpful to take that review and that feedback and give it to the leadership and say, here's what we found, here's the lessons we've learned, here are our suggestions. So I call that the implementation phase. One of the really important things that I, I think I've mentioned multiple times is that it's really a focus on the learning. How do we take the lessons we've learned and actually create more of a feedback loop for continuous improvement? Um, I tend to paraphrase and restate and summarize a lot in one of these sessions so that I can get stuff out of the attendees um, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of developers are introverts. <laughs> and they don't like to participate in these kinds of meetings because it's more difficult for them. 
They don't want to have their voice heard by all of these people. So you need to learn ways to get that information out of them because everyone has learned a lesson. And some of those lessons will be useful for other people. But if you can't speak up about them, we can't learn from them. So um, I am one of those people who is really interested when we do these in being kind. These are very difficult conversations to have, especially if it's something where your site has gone down. If you have to do an AAR because your site was down for 30 minutes, it's going to be a really difficult conversation, much more difficult than a latency issue. So you need to be able to be kind, sort of an empathetic response, I'm going to say. Um, and again, I know I've harped on this, participate. Introverts really, you really got to figure out how to get people to participate. And not just the introverts, but you got to get the extroverts to step back and stop talking so much because they will talk over the introverts. It's a cultural, it's that cultural competency to be able to tell how to get folks to participate in a way where we all can learn. There we go. Um, I know I've already talked about the meeting, but what really shapes the AARs that I do are these basic questions. Now, when you look at the literature, some people say there's five. I like to use these four um, because I feel like it actually centers us better. Um, and you'll notice it starts with the should, not what actually did happen. So what should have happened with my latency issue? What should have happened is the site should have been up. The CDN should have been working. Bug Bounty should have been able to do their work. Those are all the shoulds that should have happened. But what actually happened? We can pull out the logs. I can put that information into the report because I want leadership to know what we found. And sometimes flood, flooding them with logs, although it doesn't look pretty, makes them actually realize that we did look at stuff before we actually did the meeting. Um, the next question is, what can be improved upon and how? This again is all about that learning experience. If you can get everyone to talk and share, you find that there are so many other lessons that can be learned. Who is accountable for your action items? So at the end of the meeting, before we leave, it is really important that you figure out what those action items are. For us, it was those three, um, the, I didn't talk about the third one. The first one was to fix the CDN issue. The second one was to add the CAPTCHA. The third one was to add it to our RACI so that the survey, server team, who is not the team that I was working on, would know. And we involved them in the meeting so that we could add it to their chart so that they knew when they needed to contact us as well. When was it going to be an alert for them, not just for us? So this is for the further reading. These are a bunch of links and it's very tiny. So feel free to come up and ask me for these. I really highly recommend the Log Rocket blog post, it's fantastic. And most of these are from 2024. After action reviews are becoming more of a hot topic lately. I'm not sure why they are, but I love it. I have found that they are very useful, at least at my job and the work that I do. And I hope that it becomes more useful for other folks. I'm hoping that we can have a discussion if you've done them before, that we can talk about them as well. I also talk really fast. So this was a quicker session than I was expecting. Um, my conclusion is, is that um, this happens. Bad stuff happens, and it's going to happen. How we react to how and what that is is really important. We can either go, yeah, that happened, or we can go, hmm, that happened. What can I learn from it? How can I incorporate that into future work? How can we make this never happen again, but also prevent what could be lurking in the background too? 
Um, I also have, and I will share this in just a second, this document, which is the one I use, it's like a template for AARs. Pop out of that. So this is what I use for an AAR. Maybe I'll make that a little bit larger. Maybe I'll make that a little bit smaller. Okay, so I try to do this on a one page. I try to do this handwritten while I'm also recording. Um, if at all possible, the first two sections, the what should happen and what happened, I try to get those done before. And then I share this document out with the team who's going to be participating in the meeting. At the meeting, we talk about the next two. And we talk about it until I'm basically blue in the face. What could be improved? So if someone says, X happened, and then the question is almost like being in a comedy troupe, and that's the and yes, and yes, and yes. So, what can be improved? Okay, X happened. Well, what did we learn from that? What can you improve then? And you keep doing it until you no longer have answers. And it usually takes a while. And even at this point, I still don't let, I still don't let the folks who are watching, who can be in the meeting and are not allowed to participate, I continue to not allow them to participate. I try to, throughout the meeting, remind folks that they are there to watch. They are there to listen. If for some reason they really want to say something, they need to put it down in writing and send it to me. And I will take that information and either incorporate it into our feedback or not. But as the facilitator, it's my choice. It's really hard for some leadership, by the way. The last item is always the who is accountable for these action items. So if we're going to go through the whole process of all of this, I want to make sure that what this action item is has a person who is accountable for it. If we are adding this information to a RACI for the server side team, I want to know who is going to add it. How are we going to verify that they're going to contact us the next time this happens? How do I know that the security person who has already heard from Bug Bounty team, how do I get them to tell me that there's going to be a Bug Bounty coming up? Um, I need to make sure that all of these action items have someone who's accountable for it. And then I check back and I follow up. Because it's important to make sure that we've incorporated it into our lessons learned. So some of the really great ones that are out there um, Asana has a really good after action report. It is much more broken down than what I would normally do. I'm, again, I'm in government, so four questions is about all I'm going to get people to do. But the Asana one has a really nice little template. And I'm not saying you should use the Asana one, it's just a really nice template. It so, looks pretty too. And it looks pretty. So what it, what it helps, at least for the planning phase, is all of this stuff up here is planning. Then you get into the actual AAR. But as you can see, most of what you do in an AAR is actually planning. And if you plan this well, you will learn a lot. So I do recommend the Asana template. I mean, I don't use this specifically. Um, but that, again, <laughs> government. I also found this blog post for doing an AAR from LogRocket is fantastic. I really liked how they did the analysis between the difference between an AAR on a retrospective, post-mortem. It gives you a really good idea of what you can get out of it, and also what you can get out of like a retro and a post-mortem. But what's really helpful is this. He gives you like these really good um, bullet points to, to think about as you plan each step. 
uh, highly recommend. And I really also like, this is my favorite one. So I saved it for last. USAID put together really recently too, an entire guidance on how to conduct one. It is extremely thorough. Move it past there. It is extremely thorough. They really break it down into why it's important for each of the steps and then how to actually do it. And their feedback on the different planning stages is fantastic. I cannot recommend this more. And I love the fact that they also put all these extra white spaces in there so you can take notes. Not just notes for your review, but actually notes so that you can manage the review that you're gonna do. So those are some of the resources that I highly, highly recommend. But again, an after action review, it's not new. We've been doing them for at least 30 years that I know of. I've used them at multiple agencies. And I really highly recommend any one of these resources. So that is me in a nutshell and my passion for after action reviews. And thank you. And don't miss Drupal Gov Gone, August 13th through 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Stephen. Um, two, and they're maybe sort of related. Um, so I'll ask them both. Uh, okay. First one is uh, how much pre thought do you suggest that participants, other than the facilitator, do prior to uh, the, the actual meeting? And two, um, is there any nuance when you've got like junior staff who's been involved uh, who maybe they don't have the experience and maybe that inexperience was a factor in in the incident like you know you've got like senior staff who maybe wasn't involved directly like how do you kind of work with that tension make it productive but still retain morale yes <laughs> maintaining morale be kind um, when we did the um, recent, on a recent project I was working on, the new junior dev that we had was a junior tester. And he wasn't as familiar with the setup, the architecture of the site, and didn't find all of the bugs. Now, the bugs that got missed were not they were not um, roadblocks. They weren't like, oh my God, site's gonna go down. It wasn't like that. It was just like, why is, why is that padding off? So what was really important to me when we did the AR with the junior is to get him to talk about what he did and what led to missing these, these small items. But what we discovered was that it wasn't just the tester. It wasn't him being the junior dev that was the problem. The problem was, is we were pushing out a change the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We had the senior dev was trying to push a change while working on another project because she is 50% on my project and 50% on another project. And as we all know, no one is really ever 50% and a 50%. That's more like 40% and 40%. She dropped the ball. It wasn't the junior tester who dropped the ball. And when we realized it was her, because she was getting ready to go out of town for Thanksgiving, what in hindsight should have been a simple development push, Honestly, there were three very small features. The fact that we missed all of these things, primarily because we were trying to do it too quickly, because we were more interested in getting it out than making sure it was right. And that really became a very clear problem. After we did the bug fixes and everything got pushed out, 
between when the first change happened the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and before we could get all the fixes in was January 3rd. Thankfully, it wasn't a showstopper. But after January 3rd, I go to the, the folks and I say, okay, we're going to have a discussion now. We're going to do an AAR. And everyone freaked out. So then I had to go and spend some time. So you find as a facilitator, you spend a lot of time massaging egos. <laughs> um, I went back to not only the dev, not only the project manager, but the technical architect. And I talked to each of them individually. And I talked to them as a group. Here's how we're going to do it. I need a root cause analysis because it's the first two bullet points. What was supposed to happen, what actually did happen. Now I need an analysis. I want to put all of that in there. And then we're going to have the meeting. So before the meeting, I had them do this root cause analysis. We took that, sent it to the team. And then I went back and I said, who needs to be in this meeting? And then they freak out again because they don't want leadership in this meeting. And I said, no, nope, that's not how this works. We need to have them in there because they need to see the, what happened and how we're resolving it. Because it gives them um, sort of a confidence that we can handle problems as they come up in the future. Once, once I got that done, suit those egos, I then contacted the leadership and I said, okay, we're gonna have an AAR, this is what the process looks like. Here's the information. You are permitted to be in the meeting. You are not permitted to speak. I had um, <clears throat> some folks who were not happy with that, and I then provided them the avenue for how to reach me so that I can incorporate any feedback they have, but it was really important that they not speak because I have a junior dev. I have a senior dev who was just, who simply shouldn't have been pushing that change at the time that she did. It sh we just shouldn't have. And I had other members of the stakeholder team in there as well, who once they heard everything and how it all transpired, they were like, oh, yeah. We really didn't need it to be done the thanks the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We could have actually put that off. So now in the future, we know part of the action items was to actually involve the stakeholders in our timelines and tell them when a feature isn't gonna get pushed. And we do much better sort of like sprint to sprint planning than we had done in the future because that came up. We noticed little things that we had dropped the ball on over the last six months before that change got pushed. Again, thankfully, it was a very small issue. But coming out of that process, the whole team came together in a way that I hadn't expected before. And that junior dev is now a mid-level dev on another project and is no longer testing. So he got to actually advance based off of the work that he got to do for our team, which I think is really important and useful. Did I answer the question? Yes. Okay. Very good. Anybody else? All right. I, sorry, I wrote down a few questions. Um, first of all, how do you tell extroverts not to take over? <laughs> Um, usually I silence them. Um, so if we're going to do it on a Zoom call, I will tell them if they um, are speaking too much that I will simply mute them because I have the mute button and I can do that. If it's in an in-person meeting, I work really hard at incorporating their feedback into the meeting and then oftentimes we'll say, because I'm an extrovert, it, this, this will work with an extrovert usually. If someone just says to me, great, thank you, I've got your feedback, well, we're going to move on to this person now. I don't like it all the time, but I also think when someone says that to me, I'm talking too much. And if I'm talking too much, that means someone else can't talk. So it's a learning experience for me as well. You know, I've been in meetings where a person like, starts talking and they don't even stop to take a breath. They stop for like 20 minutes in a half an hour meeting and they're like, oh my god. And I don't know if they realize this or like, this is 
like poor etiquette. Really. It is poor etiquette, yes. And if you run into that problem and you're possibly going to have that issue in an AAR, maybe address it before the meeting. Yeah. And let them know if you're a participant, I'm going to time box you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Time box. Um, what uh, artifacts come out of this, uh, if, if any? Um, usually it's that one pager that I do, okay. plus any logs that we've used for any analysis. Why, why can't watchers participate? Like, why, why even have them then? Um, leadership likes to be involved. That's the only reason. Okay. But then why not have them talk? Right? Did you take over? Because they have, they have no background. They have not participated. They weren't involved. They really just want to be involved. And so if you want to be involved, that's fine. You can't talk. So I give them the out. Like if you see something that's happened that you think I should know about, email me. Put it in a document. Give it to me. And then having them there, does it like, does it, does it like uh, keep others from talking freely? Um, I, th I think for the contracting team that we were working with, that that I was working with, at first, that was definitely an issue. So it's really up to your facilitation. Part of this to get that information out of them. Because I will say that the junior dev was terrified. And it was clear he was terrified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because understand. he's new to this job. Yeah, exactly. And he screwed up. Well, he didn't screw up. And the, it's really important to be able to show your leadership. It wasn't you who screwed up. It was all of us. And this is a learning experience. Yeah. So, yeah. And that leads into my last question is like, how do you like prevent or avoid finger pointing? Because I think it'd be very easy to get into that mode. Yeah, typically that will that will come up. But when we do the background stuff before the meeting even starts, I get everyone in the frame of mind of we're not gonna point fingers. And it also happens far enough out. So like for the situation where we did the push before Thanksgiving and we didn't get the change in until January third, mm -hmm. we didn't hold this meeting until February. Mm -hmm. So people have been able to calm down, mm -hmm. be less like freaked out about it. Mm -hmm. When you're in the army and you're you're doing this in the field, it's usually like either right afterwards or like the day afterwards. But in this situation, I needed everyone to be calm, yeah. so that when we actually have this discussion, you have all of this other knowledge that happened. Well, let's look at all of it. Let's really analyze what each of our roles were. So. Well, mm -hmm. I think you should build a room that has a two-way mirror. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we could do that too. Yeah. The AAR room. <laughs> that sounds like something the military probably already has. Yeah. Something I found more though is that in, in reactive environments and so the proactive ones that you're gonna find using using this template is more, uh, I mean, it's just gonna happen more. Because you're, you're, when, you're, when you're active, you can't prepare for a certain situation. We had one pop up where uh, it, it, it went out to our emergency syndication um, system, and it was because the campus was closed, there was no power. Um, and uh, we, we it, was, it was the responsibility of the public relations officer to push out the message and um, they 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 had been trained because they fired the person that knew everything and um, uh, whenever that happened um, they just said well it was a technical glitch and it wasn't a technical glitch it's just they didn't know how to use it the system was very easy to use they just didn't know how to do it and uh, so it, 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 it then fell upon the web team, you know, us to 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 take care of all the messaging, um, and then afterwards, you know, we're getting blamed. IT is getting blamed for a problem that really wasn't a problem. It was, you know, just a break in communication and a, and a loss of some knowledge. Um, and, and and we did we did the we did the um, after action review. Uh, we had a, a spreadsheet and it had everything listed out timeline. 
and um, it had every one of us uh, actually designated as a certain manager or part of the pro uh, part of the the whole the whole thing that happened, um, and and we, um, we we walked through it that way because you know we, we kept telling ourselves that you know it's better to have a receipt uh, for whenever all of the, the the VCs get together and start pointing fingers at everybody you know like look this is exactly what happened this is why it happened yeah those are always helpful as well yeah. I have a question. We do our we do RCAs, and I'm wondering if there are situations where an RCA is more appropriate than an AAR, or if an AAR is always the more appropriate. Log Rocket. Log Rocket, the blog post that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. he does the whole thing about when it's more appropriate to use um, which one, whether it's postmortem or an AAR, or um, a root cause analysis, whatever it's going to be, he has it really broken out very nicely. That makes it a lot more understandable. But my understanding is you don't have to have just one, right? Like you no. Can have, yes. Yeah, you can have the root cause analysis, and you can then even have the AAR, because the root cause analysis can lead into the AAR. That's how, that's how I use it. We do the root cause analysis first, so that I have all of my my ducks in a row before we even start taking a look at what the lessons we can learn from. So, but sometimes you don't actually need to learn any lesson from something. Maybe it was uh, a Kubernetes issue. Um, right. If it, it literally is a technical thing, a root cause analysis, you, yeah. you can you stop. Apply a patch. Exactly. Right. I mean, the analysis is, oh, <laughs> we forgot this patch. Okay, well, that right. solves it. But when it's something where it's like a communication failure or um, we should learn from the mistake, like, okay, we needed to verify more patches more frequently, those kinds of issues will come up when you do an AAR. I'm, I'm wondering if the way we do our RCAs leads to that we use this technique from the pipelines. And so you, you, have this, you have this stated problem, okay, problem that's happened, why did that happen? Oh, well, we didn't have this patch. Okay, so why didn't you have this patch? Oh, we didn't know about the patch. Why didn't you know about the patch? Right? And you go down, and you know, for each of the issues, you do this, these, these five whys, and that really uncovers like the, the learning part of it and the lessons learned that can then feed into your action items. So I'm wondering if the way we're doing our CAs is it, almost? Almost, like, yeah. Like yeah. I mean, the, I, what I'm hearing that's different is that you don't have the action items assigned to an actual human being who will track it. Right. It's basically what that, that action item and accountable person is. Gotcha. And you get those accountable people to be responsible for those items because they're important to them too. Um, but yeah, that's the only thing I can see that's missing. Very cool. Well, thank you. I, I, um, proposed this session to April before I even proposed it. I was like, I really find this useful and I don't know how many other people even do this. And then it's become like a thing this year, which has been nice to see. Yeah, it's a lot better than having teams pointing at each other from across the, the room. It, it's much better. We, we find it, uh, I, I think what we also find is that whoever's moderating has to have a good strong personality, as you pointed out. They have to be respected by the team. Yeah. You get these people that just monopolize the conversation. Oh, yeah. You know, or, or somebody who isn't with the program and, and wants to start something laying around. You know, that's not the language we, we, we're using here. I mean, in his example, I don't think you need that really a good moderator yeah. for that particular issue since it was such a communications issue. But a really good facilitator and moderator really gets you past a lot of that anger and bad feelings and also giving enough time to your team to process can also help. That's a great question. How much time between an incident should you... It depends. So it really depends. On the, the incident with the latency issue, we did it um, once we had access to all of the logs, which took like four days to get access to. We actually did it two weeks after the event. For the issue with the November <laughs> deployment that went bad, um, we didn't hold it until February. 
And there were lots of reasons for it. We wanted that junior dev to feel more comfortable in his role. He literally had just joined our team when we did all of this. So we shouldn't have done it. So it was really important to have time for him to be more confident in his role. So it really just depends on the actual incident and how you want to take that information and reincorporate it into your team. Yeah, uh, if it's a new dev, even even if that seems more like a, an onboarding or hey, don't give them permissions yet issue. <laughs> if they don't yeah. know yet what 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 not to do. Oh no, I was yeah. I was not happy with the contracting company. Yeah. I'm still not happy with the contract mm -hmm. company, and hopefully we'll be out of them soon. Mm -hmm. This is not recorded, so. Yeah, um, yeah that it is what it is. I, I did not feel like he was prepared for what we were doing. And I did bring that up, that, you know, if we have a junior dev, you need to be able to mentor him. Mm -hmm. You can't just throw them into a project. And our project, although not exactly complicated, it's just a web page. It's still complicated enough for a junior dev for when they're looking for bugs. Yeah. You need to mentor that. And they do That's not why we never let the junior people do like that because it backfires so many times. It's like yeah. give it to me and I'll do it. Because <laughs> I've been there 19 years, I can find stuff, but not don't let them do it. <laughs> no let them. Yeah, it takes institutional knowledge and all kinds of other skills that you may not have learned yet. Yeah. It's true. I, I it's call true. it tacit knowledge. It's in your head and nobody else knows it. It's not documented. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, how long do these meetings take when you do an um, AR meeting? Like, is it all, all day? I mean, I, no. I guess no. I don't go. Like, at most, 90 minutes. No way, really? Yes, at most, 90 minutes. Uh, um, the one for the with the junior dev, that one lasted, I, I think about 80 minutes, almost an hour and a half. With the one for the latency issue, I think we were done at 30. Uh, because we had all that background and we understood, <laughs> but with the, the junior dev thing, because we were, everyone's trying to blame him. It wasn't him. And everybody else needed to come to grips with the fact that Blaming him was actually part of the issue. Right. So it took longer to get us there. And you can do this. How, how about yours? Did you well, I mean, so 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 part of ours, we, we we had a separate incident where the site actually went down, and it turned out to be something with our OC provider and, and all, and and it made it a whole lot easier just by following the template and and saying, okay, let's stick to these questions. Forget the blame, you know, let's stick to the questions and, and then you found what the root cause was. And then the most useful thing though, and what we focused on the most was like, what are our what are our action items? What, what can we take away from this to fix? Because we actually did, oh, our site went down and it went to the emergency site. Our emergency site had broken links on it. We didn't know that. <laughs> so let's it's fix a, that. It's amazing the things that you yeah. find out when you yeah, do it. Yeah, so, yeah. So I mean, it, was, it, was, it was beneficial in some ways. But the communications issue, I mean, that was a problem because uh, when I think that's another issue is like if your execs aren't going to fight for you and and if they don't even understand what happened, you know you're you kind of messed up there. Yeah. So it, it's unfortunate in that, but um, we sent one of our devs to a meeting with a bunch of execs because our exec was out on vacation. I don't know, but it turned out okay. But. You know, Maybe next time invite them as watchers, so, so they can watch you at the meeting. Yeah. Like when you're when you're really in that. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. It really worked for us. They they were um, much more congenial afterwards. Yeah. And, and we, keep them quiet, hard. I think yes. you do this on Zoom as well. Like yeah. Zoom oh, it's so much easier when you can actually mute someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.